Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Erin O'Connor, and I just want to thank you, first of all, for joining our virtual homeowner wildfire preparedness webinar. Um, we'll wait just a few more seconds and see if we get a few more folks trickling in, and then we will get started. Um, we have some really excellent presentations lined up for you tonight, and we are excited to share this information with you. So sit tight, and we'll be back in just a minute. All right. Um, welcome again to our virtual homeowner wildfire preparedness webinar. Um, we are so glad to be here with you tonight. We have some excellent presentations lined up um, to share some important information and answer any questions that you all might have about wildfire preparedness. Um, so if you do have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat on the right hand side of your screen. Our presenters are open to questions and we will answer them throughout the webinar as well as have some question and answer time at the end of the presentations. So the goal of this webinar is to provide Texans, you all homeowners, um, with some wildfire preparedness and prevention information to help reduce your risk from wildfire. Um, tonight we'll be talking um, about our current situation, um, our, our wildfire activity across the state, um, some wildfire prevention information, home preparedness tips, and evacuation planning. Then we'll provide you with some resources and again have some time for questions. Um, we anticipate this webinar to be about one hour. Um, if you can't stay for the entire presentation, we will be recording it and we will post it to social media and our website um, likely tomorrow or later this week. So a little bit about who we are, Texas A&M Forest Service was created by the Texas Legislature in 1915, and we are the state forestry agency for Texas. We conserve forests, trees, natural resources of the state, and we also protect the lives and property from wildfire and all hazard incidents. Um, we are the lead agency for wildfire suppression in the state and one of the lead agencies for incident management. The agency is also a member of the Texas A&M University system and we fulfill the service component of the land grant system. So as I mentioned, we have some really great speakers to chat with you today, um, so I'll introduce them real briefly. So we have uh, myself, I'm Erin O'Connor, I'm our lead public information officer. Um, I'm currently stationed at our headquarters in College Station and I've worked for the agency about seven years. Um, we have Heather Gonzalez. She is our program specialist for the prevention program. She stations in our Victoria office, office excuse me, and has worked for the agency about five years. Um, Alex is the Community Wildfire Protection Plans Program Coordinator, and he works out of our Austin office, um, and he's been there since 2020. And we have Carrie Hines, who is our Firewise Program Coordinator. She serves in our LaGrange office and has been with Texas A&M Forest Service since 2012. And then finally, you'll hear from Karen Stafford, who is our Wildfire Prevention Program Coordinator. She works in our Lufkin office, and she has been with the agency for 20 years. So a little bit about our current situation. Um, the 2020 winter spring fire season has trended above normal for acres burned, um, as well as the number of fire responses. To date, um, our agency has responded to 4,417 wildfires, that have burned more than 500,000 acres. And this is since January 1st. Um, so certainly, certainly a busy year for fire activity. How did we get here? 
So no two fire seasons are the same, um, but there certainly are common threads to previous fire seasons and some of the some of the conditions that we're seeing this year we've previously experienced. So a lot of people like to make comparisons with this year in 2011, and so we are certainly seeing some commonalities, but we're also seeing um, some similarities between 2006, 2008, 2009, as well as 2018. So some of the commonalities, um, we, we've been experiencing La Nina conditions. So this is when our temperatures are above normal. So we've had warmer, um, hotter temperatures throughout the year. Our precipitation patterns um, are drier. So we're receive, receiving less rainfall and precipitation than in non La Nina years. Um, and so those conditions certainly support wildfire activity across the state. Um, a previous wet summer, so last year in 2020, we experienced um, a wet summer where a lot of grass um, and vegetation was produced and grown across the states. So we just have an overabundant amount of vegetation um, that is ready to burn across the state. Um, so again, more ignitions or excuse me, more grass increases our ignitions, intensities, the spread of the wildfires. We are also experiencing drought conditions. So we had a drought that emerged in the fall and it has continued to intensify as we moved into the spring and now into the summer. And the minimal amounts of rainfall that we have received are pretty much giving us a temporary reprieve, but they are not significant enough to reverse the impacts of the drought that we're currently experiencing. And then we had some very in intense uh, weather patterns. Um, so we had frontal passages that moved across the state and just created um, conditions again that were conducive to wildfire ignitions and support increased activity. So each fire se season is different. Um, again, there are a lot of similarities and common commonalities between the previous fire seasons. However, it's still too early for us to say that this is going to be another 2011 or another 2018. Um, we still have the rest of the year to get through. But what we do know is that as we transition into the summer months, we're going to continue to see wildfire activity. Um, we will have those warm, dry conditions. We have that increased vegetation across the state, and that will continue to dry and be a source of activity and ignitions. Um, and we will continue to have these drought conditions until we get a long duration rainfall event. However, it's not all doom and gloom. There are definitely some things that you all can do to keep yourselves safe, keep your home and your property safe, and help our firefighters um, create a safe workspace. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Heather and she'll um, take over talking about some prevention met methods for you. Hello everyone, uh, let me get this pulled up. Today I am going to be talking to you about wildfire prevention. I am a program specialist based out of Victoria. Um, so first we're going to go over why, why is prevention and mitigation important? Um, first off, 97% of Texas is privately owned. 86% of wildfires occur within two miles of a community and 74% occur within one mile of a community. So it's, it's really important to prevent what wildfires we can to protect our communities. Um, and nine out of 10 wildfires are caused by people. So that means nine out of 10 wildfires are preventable. So whenever we look at our wildfire causes, debris burning is by far our number one cause of wildfires. Um, so if you are planning on doing any debris burning in the future, we definitely recommend that you take precautions and you follow especially local burning restrictions. And if you are allowed to burn, if your area is not under any burn bans or burn restrictions, make sure you keep the area um, around your debris pile very small and manageable. Clear off 10 feet around the around the pile. Make sure there's no overhead obstructions. And of course, make sure you have water um, available and always stay with your fire while it's burning. And that also goes into trash burning that is included as well. If you are going to be burning some vegetation um, or burning in a burn barrel, make sure that it is well constructed metal barrel with a metal screen um, with holes no longer than five eighths of an inch. 
Also make sure there is venting at the bottom of the barrel, um, three inch vents backed with a metal screen uh, that will allow better airflow with the burn barrel. And again, with that one, also make sure that the ground is cleared about 10 feet um, on all sides. So whenever we're looking at if you're allowed to burn, if you're allowed to have either a burn barrel or do any debris burning, you want to make sure that you check with your local jurisdiction, local restrictions for burn bans or burn restrictions. This is a map that has been updated as of today of counties that have burn bans. As you can see, 134 counties are under a burn ban within Texas. Um, but you can always call your local county office, local fire department to double check if you are under a burn ban. So um, another wildfire cause is arson. Um, one thing that we see in the summer months is an increase in arson related activity, um, especially including uh, wildfires. So arson um, is a crime that poses a serious threat to life and property. Um, to be classified as arson, a person has to intentionally set a fire or set an explosion, um, or this person was purposely being reckless with the possibility of endangering someone's life or someone's property. If you do happen to see any arson related activity, we have the hotline number there. It's 1-800-364-3470. Um, and just make sure you report um, if you see something, say something to your local authorities. Um, other causes that we have been seeing an increase of lately, uh, especially is roadside starts from vehicles. So um, vehicles driving through dry grass or, you know, pulling off into the shoulder of the road and parking, idling, driving through dry grass, the, the catalytic converter underneath your vehicle can get extremely, extremely hot. And with the dry, um, dry vegetation that we've been having, it can very easily ignite some tall grass underneath the vehicle. Um, also, when towing trailer chains, make sure those chains are not dragging on the ground and um, make sure they're, they're picked up and secured. Also make sure that your tires are inflated properly. Underinflated tires can uh, have be a wildfire hazard. Um, the wheel rim can um, go against the road and potentially ignite a roadside fire that way. Also going into equipment with uh, whether it's heavy equipment um, such as hay balers, UTVs, welding, um, anything like that, make sure with um, with like hay balers and that's those sorts of equipment, make sure that you're removing any accumulated grass and debris from moving parts. Um, inspect belts, bearings, brakes, uh, and, other, and other parts for uh, failures or excessive heat, and also make sure this equipment is well maintained. If possible, store a fire extinguisher on the, this equipment as well. And then whenever you're welding, cutting, grinding, uh, try to have a spotter that can keep an eye for keep an eye for sparks. Um, make sure the area is clear of vegetation and wet down your work area. And if possible, avoid welding on windy days. Um, we have seen an increase in wildfires from welding recently uh, just due to the dry vegetation and welding does throw a lot of sparks. So going into the summer months, we're going to be going outside more, going on vacations, and just engaging in a lot of recreational activities outdoors. Uh, one of those is um, using fireworks and, you know, fireworks are normally used outside of city limits and rural environments that can have um, a lot of dry vegetation. So if you are using fireworks, make sure that you are taking the right precautions. Uh, first, make sure that your local jurisdiction has not um, restricted the use of fireworks, and then always use fireworks um, outdoors on a flat, smooth surface away from any dry grass or flammable materials. 
Also keep water, wet towels, or a garden hose nearby just in case. And if a wildfire does start or if a spark does happen, make sure you notify the authorities immediately. And then um, last we have grilling campfires, um, especially with uh, especially with being outdoors more. We're going to be outside grilling more um, with the holiday weekend coming up. We might be doing some barbecues, that sort of thing. Um, so we want to make sure that we're taking precautions for that. Uh, whenever you are grilling, make sure you place your grill within an open space with nothing overhanging. Um, and never leave it unattended. Uh, whenever you are finished grilling, make sure you allow your charcoal to cool. And also never place a grill with still hot coals in the back of a trailer or in the back of a truck and drive with it. Um, those those hot coals can um, be blown out while you are driving and potentially um, start a roadside start from those coals. Um, and the same with, with campfires. If you are starting a campfire, make sure that you are doing it correctly and putting it out correctly um, with the campfire. Make sure you're doing a, um, a ring around the fire and uh, clearing the space around it. Make sure nothing is overhanging and also um, never leave it unattended. And whenever you are going to leave it, make sure you put water on it. We like to call it campfire soup, where we put water on it, stir it up, put more water on it, stir it up, and just make sure it's completely cool before you leave it. And that covers um, most of our preventable causes of wildfires. Um, last thing I'm gonna leave you with is our Smoky Bear license plate. We do have a license plate that you can go to uh, your local uh, tax office and request a Smoky Bear license plate for $30. 22 of those dollars will go to a grant fund for fire prevention projects in communities at risk. Thank you. All right, thanks Heather. Um, and we have a question in the chat from Kelly. So chainsaw operation can also sometimes start fires. Yes, um, we'll have Karen answer that one for you, Kelly. Hi, thanks Erin. Um, and thank you Kelly for the great question. Um, so yes, chainsaws can start fires. Um, so some things to be very careful of when um, when using your chainsaw is make sure that that chain doesn't come into contact with any kind of rocks or metal or anything like that because uh, that will cause sparks that could ignite the grass and start a uh, grass fire around you. Um, but then also, you know, making sure that the motor is um, fully operational and safe and not throwing out any hot metal fragments. Uh, make sure there's a spark arrestor in place. Um, make sure there's no debris getting caught up in that chain that could also become overheated um, and that, you know, come into contact with that hot motor as well. So, yes, thank you very much, Kelly. I'm also going to follow up in writing in the chat section as well, just so you can keep it for future reference. Keep the questions coming, guys. All right, thanks, Karen. Um, so now we'll move on to Alex, who's gonna speak with us about home preparedness. All righty, so again, my name is Alex Bergenzer. Uh, I am a program coordinator handling wildfire hazard mitigation planning. Um, I'm gonna be talking about home hardening defensible space, uh, why these concepts are important and what we can do on a practical level about um, these concepts. So first let's define home hardening and defensible space. Uh, home hardening is essentially modifying your home uh, or structure to make them more resistant to embers and other sources of ignition, whether that be from direct flame contact or from radiant or convective heat. Uh, defensible space describes an area around a home or a structure uh, that's been treated to remove combustible materials and vegetation to reduce the likelihood that a fire could spread, therefore reducing your wildfire risk. Uh, so there are several ways that we can accomplish these concepts, and I'll discuss a few of those in the next slides. Uh, the quote at the bottom is going to be attributed to Jack Cohen, uh, who is a wildfire research scientist from the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, Mr. Cohen spent his career focusing on uh, the ways in which wildfire can impact structure loss uh, and found through firefighters' firsthand accounts as well as conducted research that embers uh, were the leading cause of home ignitions and structure loss during wildfire events. Uh, so these two concepts of home hardening and defensible space uh, take this research into consideration 
And they also offer a way for homeowners to reduce their wildfire risk in an effective manner. So why are these concepts important? Uh, the wildland urban interface is an area where undeveloped uh, landscapes are meeting and interfacing with developed spaces. So these interfaces are rapidly growing throughout the state and are found in many of our communities. You may actually be living in or near the wildland urban interface and not even know it. So these spaces are particularly vulnerable to home loss during a wildfire event uh, due to the proximity of structures to vegetation as well as several other characteristics uh, such as the topography and past fire occurrence. So hardening structures and creation of defensible space uh, will allow us to live within the wildland urban interface uh, while also reducing the risk of structure loss. So home hardening creates homes that are less vulnerable to wildfires even without firefighter, firefighter fire department intervention. Uh, so think about your neighborhood for a second in your local fire department. Um, this concept of home hardening is important because again, you know, in a typical house fire, there are generally a lot of resources available to help. Uh, while in a wildfire, there are never enough personnel or engines to directly protect every single home. So in, in contrast to that, in addition to that, uh, creating defensible space will allow firefighters to better protect your home during a wildfire. Uh, additionally, defensible space can be used to redu reduce the risk uh, that a wildfire would be able to get near your home or property by reducing the potential for fire spread. So what can you do about this? Uh, for home hardening, there are two ways to address the risks, uh, low cost and higher cost. Uh, so low cost measures can be anything from cleaning out your gutters, uh, removing debris from your roof, like the picture uh, in this slide, um, as well as you know, removing or pruning vegetation around a porch or a deck, uh, creating a, a stop gap in your fencing uh, with a fire resistant material versus wood or something that's combustible. Uh, you can also install window or vent screens that'll stop ember intrusion. Uh, there are some higher cost methods, um, measures that, you know, that could include replacing a roof to have a more fire rated roofing. Uh, it could also be replacing a deck or siding uh, with another fire resistant material, replacing a, a wood fence or creating gaps in that fence with a non combustible material, um, such as replacing a wooden fence post with a metal or stone. Uh, it could also be replacing your windows uh, that are single paned with something that's double or multi paned. Uh, you know, while, while these higher cost measures can really be financially heavy at times, uh, they should be taken into consideration when available. You know, for example, uh, removing your debris that's on your roof is great, uh, but if you have a cedar shake roof, replacing it would be even better. So with the creation of defensible space, uh, your work doesn't need to be perfect, but it does need to start somewhere. So there are really three vegetation management zones that can help bring you into focus on, on where to start. Uh, so starting at your front door, the immediate zone is going to be that most important uh, area for you to focus on, um, and that's going to be working from the structure itself to about five feet out all the way around your house. Uh, this is really going to be focusing on removing dead vegetation, uh, pruning and cleaning up plants, and putting down non-combustible material where you can. So that could be stone, that could be rock, um, something that's not going to ignite. Uh, from there, next we can look out about 30 feet from your home or structure. This zone is going to be called the intermediate zone, uh, and work here should really focus on the creation of islands or pockets of vegetation that are separated out by some sort of non-combustible or limited combustible material. Uh, this is especially important in, in garden or flower beds like we're seeing in this picture here. Uh, you can also look at trimming, pruning, and removing trees or other vegetation as needed. Uh, and making sure to keep that landscape healthy, uh, watering and cleaning where you can. Uh, generally, a healthy landscape is going to be more fire resistant. And lastly, if you have the ability to, uh, focusing on that extended zone or up to 100 feet out from your home. So here, limiting up vegetation, uh, trees, reducing the overall amount of vegetation in the landscape is important. With defensible space, though, it is important that you uh, find a balance between creating fire resistance um, and your own preferences for privacy or aesthetics. We're not advocating um, that you remove all the trees or vegetation from your property, uh, but instead we want you to think carefully about the risks and, and the trade-offs that are gonna be required in, in creating defensible space that's effective. So here are a couple of the key takeaways for home hardening and defensible space. Uh, we use this phrase, uh, from the front door to the outdoors. We want you to start by hardening your homes and structures first uh, to improve your fire resistance, keeping in mind um, you know, that there are some low cost and higher cost measures that should be considered. 
Um, some of those low cost measures can also just, you know, require a little bit of sweat equity work uh, to reduce your wildfire risk. So once you've done some of that home hardening, uh, then you should start moving outward to improve uh, the fire resistance around your home uh, to create more defensible space. Uh, this can work to create a more fire resistant landscape uh, that can also re greatly reduce the risk of, of home loss. And lastly, you want to make sure that you are finding a balance and prioritizing the projects that you're looking at doing uh, that you want to take and hardening your home and creating defensible space uh, to address the highest areas of risk around your home first. Um, and understand that, that not all the projects that need to be done can be completed at once. It's going to take some time, um, but the work is important and it can save your home in a wildfire. So this time I'll go ahead and take any questions that there are. Thanks, Alex. Um, so we do have one question from James. Um, so he is asking, are there any incentive or rebate programs for home hardening or defensible space? Uh, so as far as incentive programs, um, at least with the FireWise program, which uh, carries the wild or, uh, program coordinator for, there is a little bit of an insurance incentive uh, for creating a FireWise community. Um, for you know creating defensible space, the Texas a and Forest Service does have some grants available for uh, creating uh, fire breaks um, and and doing some some fuels reduction programs. Um, so those those are available too as well, and you can find them on our our website, uh, tfsweb.tamu.edu. And if I can, Alex, sorry, can't help myself but jump in. Um, another one that springs to mind, some cities will have rebate programs for moving into a more uh, water friendly landscape. So um, looking at uh, things that are more drought resistant and oftentimes things that are more drought, resi or drought resilient uh, are often wildfire resilient. So uh, looking at double dipping on that program. All right, good question, James, and thank you, Alex and Carrie. Um, so we will now move on to evacuation planning with Carrie Hines. Thanks so much. And I do believe you're seeing that slide there. So I'll go ahead and get started. As she said, Carrie Hines, I'm a program coordinator out of our LaGrange office, and I was asked to speak about evacuation preparedness, um, an extremely vital part of the whole wildfire preparedness process. And first and foremost, um, you need to know how your emergency management officials are going to be communicating to you. Um, of course, there is reverse 911. Oftentimes those programs just go to landlines. Um, and I don't know about you, but uh, I don't have a landline. Uh, where I live in Central Texas, uh, the uh, Regional Council of Governments, CAPCOG, uh, uses WARN Central Texas. Um, a program called Code Red, and you do have to sign up for that. Uh, you can get emergency notifications through text messages, um, through your cell phone, or over email. And you can also sign up for multiple locations. So say you have family or um, a second property in another region, uh, you can sign up for multiple addresses. So knowing how your emergency officials are going to communicate to you, first and foremost. Next is making your evacuation plan. This is especially important if you live in a, a community that we call one way in, one way out. So when you look at your house, your property, out to a main highway, do you have multiple ways of getting from your driveway out to that highway or just one? If it's just one, that's limited egress and that's a more dangerous situation to be in during a wildfire. So if a wildfire is threatening your road, you can't get out another direction. However, many communities do have multiple ways in and out, even if it's a road you don't usually travel. Uh, sometimes communities will also have emergency gates that are locked, but that can be opened in times of emergency, oftentimes through like a large ranch or other private property, and people can evacuate through a back gate. So knowing about those beforehand is a great thing. What you don't want to do is be lost in the smoke. Uh, wildfire smoke can be quite disorienting. Also, vehicles traveling through without emergency lights, even with emergency lights, can be very hard to see. 
Also find out if your community has designated gathering spots. Oftentimes schools, community centers, senior centers will be used um, as a spot where you can automatically go to. Sometimes they do have to be opened by local officials, so it can take just a little bit of time for it to become official. But those spots are often um, hosted in conjunction with Red Cross, so it's the location that you're going to be able to find other community services. And then of course emergency kits and not just evacuation kits. I use the word emergency in particular, not just evacuation because sometimes you're stuck at home for a week with no power because an ice storm has downed the entire grid. Just pulling that example out of my back pocket. So these kits are going to contain non-perishable food, batteries, um, a lot of water, um, flashlights, candles. Um, if you um, are looking at, of course, having to evacuate. You're going to want to have something, uh, your your personal um, prescriptions and priceless items. In fact, we have the five P's. They're there on the slide. Uh, your people and pet supplies, your prescriptions, important papers, personal needs, and priceless items. And if you think beforehand, um, oftentimes we'll, insurance will want a collection of um, the more valuable items in your house and you can uh, collect those for insurance and then also save that information in your evacuation kit. Uh, same with family photos. If you digitize them, if they're not on the cloud and they're on a USB, putting a copy of that USB in your evacuation kit so it's all there ready to go. And of course, don't forget the extra charging cords and batteries. Um, other common things include um, multiple ways of, of payment, so cash, another common item. And of course, let's not just think about the people that live in our house, but the pets as well. Um, very often, pets may not be allowed at the evacuation center. So if you're not going to a friend's or family house nearby and you actually are going to an evacuation center, you need to know what sort of rules there are about housing your pets. Uh, sometimes they have to be in a kennel. Other times they just need to be on leash. Sometimes the county annual animal shelter already has plans for housing overflow of animals but hey, you're probably going to need vaccination records or else they're going to be forced to give like your distemper and rabies and parvo vaccinations. Uh, when you are thinking about evacuating your pets, think about if they're on any sort of medication. Of course, food and water for them as well. Identification, so if you get separated, um, you can be uh, um, you can identify that that's your animal. Microchipping, of course, is fabulous. That way all of your information is implanted into your animal. Um, and any comfort items, uh, choose toys, treats, anything like that. And moving on from sometimes the smaller animals to the even bigger animals, thinking about livestock. So in our more rural areas, it's imperative that we're thinking about evacuation and emergencies beforehand with our large animals, making escape plans, um, just like we want to make sure that our cats and dogs are used to getting into their kennels, making sure that your animals have some way to be recalled to a common location and get loaded up or um, put in a, a lower risk area like a um, like a, um, a tilled field or um, an arena or something like that. Um, uh, just like we heard from Heather, placing fire extinguishers on equipment, same goes here, making sure those are in your barns, vehicles, uh, ensuring that your farm has adequate water supplies and that those are labeled. That way, if people that are there besides you uh, can see them. Um, establishing backup plans for feeding livestock. Again, if you can't get there, um, do you have a way to get uh, feed to your property and sometimes for long term as well. And um, there's other state agencies, uh, Texas Livestock or uh, Animal Commission, uh, certainly Texas A&M AgriLife that can assist you with that sort of evacuation planning. And almost most importantly, I think, determine beforehand what your priorities are on your large property before the fire ever happens. Uh, we have examples back from 2011 where ranchers were telling us, let the house burn, I can replace all that. Do not let my hay field burn. Uh, hey, that barn over there, it has hazardous material in it, or it has my brand new tractor in it. Please don't let that burn. Um, and communicating those with your local emergency response officials.
More on livestock. Um, make, if, if you are making an evacuation kit for your livestock, making sure very similarly to pets, it has records, uh, ownership proof veterinary records, microchip identifications, uh, medication, tack. Um, for tack, making sure that it's not a nylon based rope, but a cotton based rope. That way, if you're exposed to a large amount of radiant heat, it's not going to melt to the animal. Uh, looking at again, food, water, first aid, plan for trailer access. Uh, oftentimes people come out of the woodwork during wildfire saying, hey, I have a trailer available. I have a trailer available. It's very hard to get those people in touch with the need during the actual emergency. So figuring that out beforehand. And again, figuring out if your local authorities have a pre-designated location for livestock. Uh, where I am in Central Texas, it's the county fairgrounds. Uh, that's a pretty common place, either show barns uh, or other sorts of arenas. If you are looking at having to uh, let your livestock go, if you're cutting fences, um, a lot of people will either shave or paint their identification information onto the animal or of course uh, brands and having records of your brands. Okay, and that's a lot of information. So a few places that you can find uh, resources. Um, of course, you don't need this exact uh, HTTPS address. You can type in just to Google. So Wildland Fire RSG, that's what we're seeing on the uh, right side of our screen. That's Ready, Set, Go. Uh, talks a lot about preparing our properties both for uh, wildfire risk reduction, like Alex was speaking about, and, actual, and evacuation preparedness. You have ready.gov slash kit. Uh, that one's going to talk specifically about building an emergency um, kit and texasready.gov slash make a plan. So that's uh, looking at your emergency preparedness plan. And that, Erin, is all I have. Okay, okay, thank you, Carrie. That was great. Um, so we don't have any new questions in the chat, but again, folks watching, like feel free if you have any questions um, or you need some information, put that in the chat. But we will um, bump over to Karen, who is going to talk about some resources that are available to you. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Um, OK, so I'm just going to wrap this up and kind of bring us home with a few resources that you can look up online. Um, the top row there are three Facebook pages that um, I highly recommend that you follow. Um, the first one being our Texas a and Forest Service. That's our main page on Facebook. Um, just really good information for all things that our agency is involved with, forestry and wildfire related. Um, the page there in the middle, the Lone Star State Incident Management team um, is a great resource for keeping up with um, current wildfire situations, uh, current weather information, um, anything like that. So definitely make sure that you're following that for up to date information. Um, and then lastly, on the far right there is our wildfire education and prevention Facebook page. Um, just another great resource for um, all kinds of wildfire prevention information, um, home mitigation, things you can do to better prepare yourself and especially as we get more into hurricane season as well because that's getting kicked off soon um, a lot of this information especially for evacuations preparing your go kits uh, things like that will also apply for all other incidents as well not just for wildfires and on the bottom row down there um, just some really useful websites as well that we highly recommend that you take a look at um, the first being text wrap that's the texas wildfire risk assessment portal and there is a really easy to follow user friendly homeowner segment within that web page where you can go in and you can uh, zero in on your area where you live, find out what your local risk is. And then it'll also give you some really useful tips and information that you can do around your home to better prepare yourself. Um, and then with that comes a lot of the firewise information, the race that go information and things like that. Um, and then next is our burn ban page. Um, you heard Heather talk about that very briefly, but um, just a really good link where you can stay up to date on all of your burn ban information um, and then make sure that the map is reflecting your county if you do have a burn ban. And if not, then that map also has our email address where you can um, help us stay updated and help us keep our map up to date as well. Um, and then right there in the middle is our fire prevention web pages. Um, we have them for all types of different seasons, for summer season, winter season, hunting season, and then just a general wildfire prevention resources page for all things wildfire prevention and preparedness. 
Um, and then uh, we have our wildfire situation web page where again you can help um, it helps you keep up with the current wildfire situation um, look out for any kind of fire weather watches um, and any other information that you need to know that's going on and then lastly um, ready.gov you've heard this mentioned a couple times Carrie mentioned it we've seen it in our chat bar on the side with some links um, this is actually probably one of my favorite uh, resources to go to that's outside of our agency um, really good place to uh, to bookmark on your web browser um, all kinds of really good information that's not just wildfire related um, you talk about tornadoes hurricanes floods um, even terrorist attacks things like that just um, another really really great resource so um, I'm gonna leave those up for a little bit so you can write down those websites and um, if we have any more questions please uh, keep dropping them in the chat there and um, that's all that I have to wrap this up um, Aaron do we have any more questions coming in yeah Karen um, we just got one from Jane um, so Jane we'll try that our best to answer this um, I think we might be a little unsure of what exactly you're asking. So Jane asks, is there a prohibition by Homeland Security for a city providing maps for alternate routes out of town? Um, so Carrie, don't know if you wanna talk about that with ev evacuation planning. I will I certainly try. And uh, more based off of just firsthand experience and not necessarily like a policy that I have written. So just going to put that disclaimer onto it from the start. Um, cities, counties are required to do a certain level of emergency planning. Um, those are done for all sorts of uh, disasters, uh, usually done through the Office of Emergency Management. Um, some of our counties have much more resources, many more resources when it comes to creating these documents than others. Travis County, for example, I'm quite near. They have a massive staff, tons of resources, obviously backed by a massive population. Um, and they, uh, Austin, uh, Fire Department Wildfire Division has been working the last few years uh, creating extensive evacuation planning and um, community shelter in place uh, maps. Um, and they are, if I'm not mistaken, are digitally housed on uh, one of their GIS platforms uh, online, uh, fully publicly accessible. Um, other counties that I know uh, say far northwest Texas that don't even have a full time office of emergency management director, but instead it's the volunteer fire chief who also happens to be, you know, a, a police officer um, will have uh, less ready to go information on, especially when it comes to a high level of really nice GIS mapping. Um, so I guess maybe a, a not so great answer. Um, and I and I do not know about Homeland Security rules, um, but I do know that evacuation planning is something that counties across the state are definitely um, talking about and thinking about, but the actual level of documentation ready to present and not just stored in their mind somewhere or in a single document on a shelf uh, will vary across the state. Um, and I think that that might be all I know about that one. OK, thanks, Carrie. Um, so we we don't have any other questions in the chat, but we're all going to hang out here for a few more minutes. So if you if anybody has any questions, um, please feel free to feel free, excuse me, to drop it in there. I also did put an email address in the chat if you have questions, um, if you want some follow-up information from the webinar if you missed these resources we can get that to you just shoot us an email um, and we'd be happy to get in contact with you and send some stuff um, if you did include your address when you registered for the webinar you will be receiving a package in the mail with some more information and some little goodies um, so you can look out for that um and yeah thank you all so much for joining us we hope that this was informative and it was a lot of information for a short time period um but we are so happy that you joined us and um, appreciate 
appreciate you all helping us um, keep our communities safe. So again, we'll hang out for a little bit, so feel free to ask some more questions. And if not, thank you so much for joining us and we'll we'll chat with you guys on the next one.